Howdy folks. Uh, for those watching the stream, I apologize, I'm slightly late. Had some last minute streaming issues. Give me a chance. Um, how is everyone? I'm ready, I've got my tea. I'm probably going to um, stop this about nine. That's the plan. Let's see how we go. See if I can do two hours. Now, oh, hi, Laurie. Thanks for telling me. Audio is good. Sorry about the fan noise. It should be slightly better with the uh, lava mics, but you can still hear it, I'm sure. Um, so, what are we going to cover today? So, literally, I just want to focus in on. Um, On any of the changes I've made uh, to the Logic Deck, um, there is some changes for the uh, mezzanine as well. Um, let me just make some notes so I don't forget. I remember. Just bear with me one second, folks. Um, Magic that changes. And I also want to talk about. Um, Right, I've got my notes made. Good. Right. So, uh, straight in. So, the first change um, on the Logic Deck is uh, the Flash. So, what, what, what I've done is I've changed the... I've removed the Hyper Flash. And I'm going to use SPI Flash. Uh, and that flash is shared between the STM32 and the IS40. In fact, the uh, configuration is much like the uh, Black Art SMX in that sense. Um, the reason I've changed it is it makes it more accessible from the existing um, HDL. 
that already has the kind of spy flash support it doesn't have the hyper flash um, I'm likely to use the hyper flash on the next gen ECP5 boards by the way but um, on the i40 I'm going to stick with the ESP9 flash um, the other thing is if you want fast access to say a program that you're running well, that's stored in the SPI flash um, probably the best thing to do is copy into the hyper hyper RAM then it's much more quickly available to you uh, and this is quite a common technique so say you're doing a soft core for example and you need a program to run you have a basic bootloader that sits in the um, memory when that runs as part part of its pre-startup it loads the contents from the SPI flash and copies them into hyper RAM and then you can run the software from there much more effectively it's much faster so uh, you don't lose anything performance wise and we've got plenty of um, hyper RAM so that should be fine the other thing is that makes it easier from programming the flash point of view so that the STM can program the flash just in the same way that it does on Black Ice MX oh welcome iPost you're on vacation <laughs> wow yes yeah, so you're not actually working when I'm streaming which is kind of cool well done So that's the first first change I've made. Um, I've also made a change to the interface. Um, the um, the FPGA part. If you remember at the top of the um, mezzanine, there's two connectors. The lower one has some STM uh, pins, and then the higher one has the FPGA pins. So I've changed that now. So all of the pins that are available um, on the P mods, as well as the four extra ones that drive the LED and a spare one, those are now available on a 24 pin uh, uh, 1.27 pitch header, which is part of the top mezzanine connector. Um, that means that you've got all the signals on a mezzanine if you want them and I'll um, in fact we can we can go into that in a sec um, that just means that the mezzanine becomes more flexible in terms of what you can put on there if you're not using the P mods for example or if you're using it in preference to the P mods because there's a lot more you can do with that many pens so effectively on the, uh, the top header of the mezzanine you've got uh, 20 IO signals from the FPGA itself which gives you some good flexibility um, obviously they're shared with the P mods so it's one or the other apart from four which aren't um, that has a knock-on effect on the mezzanine so the mezzanine design has changed just slightly one of the things that we could do on the mezzanine and I was playing around with this today in terms of the idea is um, the kind of um, uh, the default mezzanine that I was working on the initial mezzanine um, I can put um, power delivery on there possibly two channels of power delivery USB power delivery and that can either be 100 watt or 200 watt depending whether I go for dual power delivery or not um, still an option um, it will also have the debug header on it oh, that's the other thing I need to mention um, come back to this in a sec Um, 
amazing though. I'm going to forget that. So on the mezzanine now, what I could do, rather than having the LCD connection, and I will come back to the LCD in a second, is I could actually have on there the uh, HDMI connection. So the mezzanine could have power delivery. It could have the camera connection and it could have HDMI as well. Um, but if we decide to go down that route, we would need to use the STM32 to do the I squared C comms to the camera. Okay. I mean, there are different choices you can make. You could actually have, if you didn't like that, you could actually have the, you know, uh, an OVR type camera on a PMOD. Um, including the I squared C because there's enough pins to do that. But I was thinking for the mezzanine, it might be a nice combination to have HDMI and the uh, OBR camera, parallel camera connector um, combined. And we have enough pins to do that. Um, with those 20 pins, basically we have eight for the HDMI TDMS signals, you know, the four differential ones, and 12 for the OVR camera, including the clock uh, clock driver. So it's an 8-bit DV, IO, H-Sync, V-Sync, pixel clock, and obviously the clock in uh, for the uh, OVR camera. So on, the default, on that mezzanine, we could have both HDMI out and we could have camera in. So I wonder what folks thought about that. Now, what we can't have if we do that on the mezzanine is the LCD connector. Now, my thinking here is you'd never want the LCD connector and the HDMI. It's one or t'other. So I could do a different mezzanine, for example, with the LCD. Or we could have a tile that drove the LCD. Um, OK, so what's IPOSN? You Could you have dip switches to select either one? Oh, I was looking at this earlier I post. The issue, a dip switch might work, strangely. Um, the issue is to get the to switch between the LCD and the HDMI the LCD would have to use some of the HDMI data lines now the HDMI data lines in order to drive the HDMI you need to drive it with a differential signal but it's a pseudo differential signal on the ICE 40. So what you have to do is you have to basically drive it with um, three resistors, effectively. You've got two series resistors and a parallel resistor. And then you've got logic level naught and three on each of them, but one of the signals is inverted. You have to do a calculation to work out what the resistor values are, but basically that creates a differential signal that in turn then goes through two capacitors to create the uh, AC low voltage differential signal that can go into um, the HDMI. <clears throat> but in order to do that, the resistor network that you have to build in order to make that work, um, if you're using, um, I was going to use. Uh, I was going to use um, a protection chip to separate the FPGA from the HDMI signal to make it safe. Uh, it also does things like changes the uh, 5 volt signals down to 3 volt free for the HPD detect and all of that kind of stuff in the um, I squared C. Um, but it needs that differential input. That means that those eight, eight lines are basically uh, joined as four pairs by these three resistors on each 
of those four channels. And of course, if you've done that, if you've joined two, two lines with resistors, uh, you can't easily use that for then one individual lines to drive the SPI display. Um, but if you had a dip switch, you'd need an eight pin dip switch to isolate the HDMI. Um, or jumpers. Um, the SPI only requires four pins. So there is another possibility electrically speaking if i choose relatively high resistor network values that match the impedance well enough and get the right kind of low voltage differential signal by using every alternate pin of the eight i get my four pins and then the output of the unused one uh, I make an input, so it's effectively high impedance on the FPGA side. So the resistor network that connects through to it from on the, I might need to draw this actually, that might be easier, bear with me. might make it easier and I can explain what I'm doing because this might work actually I haven't thought of this without needing to use um, without needing to use dip switches yeah it's scary yeah, oh, it's on. Sorry. Right, I need a new notebook. Hold on. Uh, Let me just share this. Bear with me a sec. Uh, this software is just updated. I do hope it works. Um, Please exit notebook and sync before starting live stream. Okay. Let me just restart this thing because it's just updated. So um, whilst it's restarting, um,
Laurie saying, I'm not sure what your current plans are for the LCD. You are going to use the 24 pin ST7789 LCD, but now you're talking about using just four pins. Let me see if I can share this again, bear with me. I'll answer your question in a sec. I don't want this. Why do I quit this damn thing? It's taking me on a tour of my own device. Um, oh, this is... Right, you can stream the content from your remark on another screen by connecting to the desktop app. Connect to app. Well, this may even be better than normal, folks. That'd be good, wouldn't it? It was a bit crappy before. So let's see. Bear with me. Let me just switch and. Let's see if this works, shall we? Yay. Okay, so, um, right. So, to get the differential signal, what you do is effectively on the um, on the um, ICE 40s, you have this kind of arrangement here. So these are the pads on the chip, and you have an inverted signal and a normal signal. And then what you do is you have a resistance on each side, and then you have a parallel resistance and then you take the signal out like that you know into your 50 ohm uh, diff signal and you have to calculate what um, rs and rp rp are so of course, if I now want to use any of these signals, say I want to use this one, um, that is now linked via the resistors, two lots of RS and an RP, to the other pin. However, if I make this other pin here, if I make that an input, then effectively this has high impedance. So my signal on here won't be affected by this resistance as long as RS is low because this is high impedance going in here with the exception of at the other end here if there is a termination resistance normally you're looking for on a 50 ohm connection differential that's normally 100 ohms between the two signals but again that shouldn't make any difference because the impedance here this is uh, very high because this has been basically turned into an input which has a very high input impedance it's like a, it's like the gate of effect that means we can use this now so what you have with HDMI is you have you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have T, D, zero, T, D, uh, one, 
TD2 and TCK and all of these are plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus differential signals. So what I could do is just use the plus signal, one, two, three, four, to go into the LCD. Uh, the four signals I'm talking about, Laurie, to answer your question, was um, SBI pins. Because I think what you have is you have data or command, you have a select, and you have a clock, and you have the data line. Yeah. So I only need four anyhow. So if I collect the four positives to the LCD, I'll be okay in this case because all the minus signals you know this one this one this one and this one are high impedance through that resistor network so they're not it's probably not going to be a, a problem so does that uh, uh, answer your question Laurie The res pin, that's just reset, right? You're talking about. I already have a separate reset pin in addition to these. I think it needs a CS. Uh, uh, from what, what I remember, Laurie, it, it definitely needs four pins to drive those LCDs. It's like SPI, um, but because you're, you, your data is bidirectional, you know, I've got... RES, RES as in reset. Are you talking about reset, Laurie? Yeah, I've got a separate reset line. We don't need to use that. You only issue the reset once, right? You don't need to issue that again, do you? I'm using the same reset line I'm using on the tiles. It's a common line. You don't need to use it in the, you know, in between transactions or anything, do you? Often only work with comp complex. You mean complete reset? Are you saying that we need to reset as we're going along, or can we not? Timing of reset is important. Okay, all right, expand, Laurie. Maybe I missed something on this. Why is the timing of reset important? With respect to what exactly? The ST7789 needs an exact length of reset or it doesn't work. Often needs two resets. Oh, okay. So there's a quirk there. I need to now. I could use a line from the STM, but I'm clean out of FPGA lines in this particular example. Okay, so this is a some undocumented behaviour that requires it to be um, reset. But lots of devices don't need CS. Um, right. I mean, we could use a CS line as a, as a reset if that's the case, but are you sure that that is the case?
You can keep CS permanently low. Maybe that's why you got reset problems. <laughs> yeah, normally it's used as a transaction. Um, specifier beginning and end of uh, this one definitely has one I'm sure of it um, now the other thing is we can take a line from the STM 32 a specific reset signal if we need to I might have enough spare lines to do that but have control of backlight instead. What do you mean? Are you saying you want control of the backlight, Nori, from the STM32? Um, is it okay to reset from the STM32? We can make it whatever length it needs to be. I'm going to make a note here. Okay, so that wouldn't be any good. Oh. Okay. Um That's something we need to have a look at then. So the question is, can we um, sacrifice CS for reset? Um, well, I still can drive it in 8-bit mode, Laurie, but only if we put it on a tile or we lose the camera. We can do parallel LCD if we want, but we can't do that and the camcorder as well on a mezzanine board. The only way we could do it is by separating one or the other onto a tile. The number of pins just doesn't add up. If you've got you've got 20 pins available on the mezzanine connector from the FPGA and you need 12 for the camera for the OVR. I mean, we don't have to have, um, by the way, we don't have to have the uh, HDMI on there if you want. You could put HDMI on a tile.
So Laurie likes the HDMI on the mezzanine. What do you think I post? Do you like the HDMI on the mezzanine? The mezzanine board, by the way, uh, is the, the kind of center board that's in between all the tiles. Yeah. All right, well, let's stick with SPI then as an option on there. But maybe we could jump for the reset. Maybe jumper to CS. So that we could experiment with that. We, we will need to go through a revision anyhow. Uh, I wanted to do a mezzanine build um, with the first uh, logic deck build so we can test that. So if I put a jumper on there for now, we can select whether that goes to CS or reset. Do you think that's uh, satisfactory moving forward? And I'll try and integrate the uh, HDMI as well. Although I've just realized I don't have any HDMI connectors. Damn, forgot about that. Okay, so that's the mezzanine thing. Um, Yeah, I posted saying I personally use uh, the CS a lot, but it isn't critical. <sighs> yeah, I'll have a think. I don't think there's any way of us getting any any other signals other than from the STM32, and all these signals need to be together. So. We can experiment with trying the STM as well. Maybe I can put an STM jumper in there. Okay, moving on from that one. Um, what I wanted to talk about in a bit was the STMI's 40 interfacing, the SPI, um, and the changes that Laurie and I have been discussing. I just want to go through that on the pad so that we all understand what that is and how it works to a degree. But before I do that, the other thing that I forgot was, uh, Laurie knows that I ordered one of these. I've just received yesterday this. This is the new debugger from... Um, uh, ST. I got it from DigiKey. It was $35 I post. Good value. And you can extend it. But let's have a look inside because what you get is pretty, pretty awesome. So I'm just going to take the screws out and stuff. So that's what, how it comes. And you build it yourself, right? It's actually two boards. And there's, there's an optional other board as well that does level shifting and stuff. But here's the thing. So the, the basic board is installed, okay? And you've got a connector on the bottom for your JTAG. Let's see if I can get that to focus. And it's one of these tiny ones. Hold on. It's a teeny tiny one. Mm. 
one of these teeny tiny 1.27 pitch connectors <laughs> and that fits in the bottom like that and then you plug this into your device with a little 1.27 pitch and there's three different adapters like that all 1.27 pitch 1.27 to 10 uh, to 14 and to 20 and again these are 1.27 pitches but the other thing that you get which is really nice is you get this other board and that plugs in to the board that's in here so you open this up with the allen key at the back and they provide the allen key stick this on it there's an extender that changes the height stick that on it and then you've got access to all these connections on here so on here you've got like the normal 2.54 0.1 inch 20 pin J tag type connection um, you also got on this side things like the SWD and J tag in a line as well as a virtual com port and you've also got like SPI and I squared C and um, I think it's even got can as well but you have to add the transceiver for the can stuff so it's pretty good you know for 35 bucks I really like it haven't yet tried it I've got to get open OCD working with it. Now they've got a fork. SEM have a fork of open OCD that has support for this in. This uses DAP link. So not on this one, but on the board in here, there's actually whereas they used to use the STM32 103s, the old M3s, this uses an F7. It's really powerful. And it has high speed. USB 2 so it goes up to 418 megabits per second and it supports that link and all that kind of stuff so uh, yeah looks pretty awesome you also get a nice breakout uh, connector for these SPIs and all of that kind of stuff so it looks pretty good um, when I've got it working I'll let you know how that goes but yeah, kind of cool, man. I like that. So I thought I'd mention that, even though I haven't had time to use it yet. Okay, so there's a the little Allen key they give you. It's a little post for PCB to deal with the new sizing. Very good. So I'm going to have a bit of fun playing with that soon. I'll let you know how it goes. Um, back to normal transmission. Right, so what I wanted to cover next... Oh, I'll give you a link here. Yeah, hold on. Uh, uh, oh, I don't have my browser running... Just use ST Link. Um, I'll give you the name of it. It's um, ST Link V3 uh, so V3 V3 set. I think V3 set. I, I will dig out a link in a bit. I don't want to run the browser yet because it's going to steal all my memory, and I don't want to do that whilst I'm running remarkable 
but it, I found it on if you if you search for that term on DigiKey, you should find it. Um, I post. It's uh, I think it comes up first time. I think it did when I um, when I um, when I searched for it the other day. They actually sent it really quick as well, which is cool. Uh, I think I ordered it on Friday and I had it in the UK by Monday, which is amazing. So back to the, um, if I look at the thing here, so I need to, I've added the, maybe I need to add one more note also, STM jumper, the reset. Um, Right, so next, what I wanted to talk about was the um, STM ICE 40 interfacing. So let's just bring up a new page for that. Oh, that's interesting. It didn't default. Hmm. Oh, I just can't see it very well in this light. It's annoying. So, let me just remind you, uh, if, if you know the Black Eyes MX, you're probably already somewhere here, but let's just, just draw up here. Now, I'm just going to change the template because I can't see the dots on here. It's a bit annoying. <coughs> Um, let's choose that. So basically, we have here the SGM32. Now, what we have between that and the ICE40. is Q S P I we have um S P I oh let me just go back and touch let's do S P I first because that's So we have SPI Since it's updated the software it insists on telling me what everything does again. <laughs> yes, thank you for telling me what pen strokes does. And the SPI is done like this which is a little unusual and I'll explain this in a sec this is the flash so basically the flash sits between um, the uh, STM and the ice okay and then we've got two extra lines that go to the flash which are the hold and the WP um, by manipulating the hold and the WP we can prevent the flash uh, we can we can take it off the SPI bus effectively that's what we do we do that in black eyes mx so the advantage is so when we set this correctly we can then have a conversation with the flash whilst holding the um ice in reset because we need the reset signal as well 
okay so if we hold the ice in reset we can um, write to the flash and then we can release the hold and write protect on the flash which then enables the ice 40 to read and write over the SPI to the flash so what that means is we can write an image to the flash that the ice 40 can then boot from okay um, but we can manage the flash as well which is kind of cool the other thing that we could do here is we can use the spy to actually program the ice 40 on the fly if you're familiar with the black ice mx we use this all the time so when you're uploading and you're in the normal mode you haven't pressed the mode button to change it into flash mode when you're sending it a binary it's it's basically resetting the ice and reprogramming it dynamically without changing the flash at all and it's just faster as well um, there is some caveats with this okay and the caveats are um, I just realized I didn't have my um, light turned on it's nice to have some more light you might be able to see me Now, if you think about it, when you wire it this way, uh, where the STM is the master and the ICE is a slave, which is what you need if you're reprogramming the ICE dynamically, that also means that the wiring for the flash swaps uh, MISO and Mozzie, or serial in, serial out. Those two get swapped around which is why we have to bit bang the ice 40 when we're programming it dynamically on the black ice mx and then we can use the spy directly the spy peripheral inside the stm32 to write to the flash uh, when i thought about this afterwards i thought maybe i got those around the wrong way um, because programming flash is difficult anyhow because you have all these weights because you have the erase cycles etc so it always takes longer Laurie saying does this mean we have to do bit banging again well here is the good news right uh, when I was digging through the F7 um, and H7 rust drivers because we're writing a new black crab uh firmware in rust then i found a great little feature in there which i haven't yet tested so this is still subject to testing which is where you can actually swap the functionality of the mozo and miso so i'm hoping that there won't be any bit banging involved moving forward we will just be using the spi peripheral but before we do an, any kind of SPI transaction, we have to switch to MISO Mozzie. Um, and I will build that into the uh, SPI driver. So basically, there will be a call to the SPI driver that says flash mode or, you know, direct program mode, FPGA mode. Uh, and as long as you select that first before you do the SPI transactions, um, you should be hunky dory it should use the peripheral so it should be faster and we shouldn't have to use any bit banging and I really wasn't crossing my finger when I said that but anyhow so that's the spy side so there's a bit of good news there on the rust side um, which is good because bit banging is a you know pain in the ass so uh, because we've changed from the hyper flash to this SPI flash that's similar to the BIMX, we can do that. Now, what else do we have between these two? Actually, there is another thing which is a UART, um, which is two lines. I say it's a UART, it's a UART. What's mm, going on with this? My writing's going backwards. I haven't used this in a while. Yeah. 
So this is our kind of TX RX, which is kind of useful. <clears throat> and then the STM can send that up to uh, the USB as a serial CDC device. Again, like Black ISMX. Now, one other thing that we can do is we can take this t these two lines that we're using for UART here. We can take those two up to the mezzanine if we want because one of the things I've because I've changed the pins around or am changing the pins around on the hardware because of the reorg when I've removed the hyper flash I've got two now really good adjacent pins that are a pair um, we could theoretically use this as a USB for the FPGA so in order for that to work, what would happen is you'd have to disable the UART and the STM, basically make it high impedance, um, and then connect a USB connector to it, and then use it as a uh, you know a low bandwidth direct USB from the FPGA. So that's just uh, one possibility that we have now. Now that the lines I'm using here are a bit better, but officially those lines are TX and RX. OK, that's for UART purposes. There may be a secondary feature um, where you're running a soft core, where you want to output USB. You know, maybe if you're using, you know, uh, at TNT's number two SOC. Yeah. So we've got those two lines between the STM and the ICE. Now, the important other one. So, um, when we were talking about um, SPIE, Q, SPIE, or Q SPI, or Q's Pi, as I like to call it, which is Q SPI with events. Um, when we were looking at this, uh, when we were looking at this previously on the last stream, we had QSBI link. Okay. We also had an additional, what we called, uh, DIR link, which is a single pin, and then we had three event pins. So uh, the new design basically gets rid of the DIR, uh, sorry, the extra event pins, which I want to just mention briefly now. Uh, now he's got a question. Would you put a USB connector on the mezzanine board? Uh, well, Laurie, yes, I do. I have one or two for the power delivery. So I could jumper the IOs to that connector if I wished. And we could use it as a regular USB and power delivery if we wanted to. Or, you know, and or. Um, so back to the uh, Q's Pi. So what we're doing is we're getting rid of the extra free event lines. There's a few reasons for this. One is it takes more lines and we were going to have to double those up with the SPI, which makes the SPI driving much more complicated. Um, secondly, when I looked at the protocol, um, we weren't really getting an advantage for those. So let's look at the timing for that. So before, I think we had, um, what did we have? We had QSBI, we had DIR, and we had events. And I think what we did was, oh, we need, so, hmm. 
I'm going to have to fill this out a bit more, otherwise this is going to start again. So let's, let's start from the top. So let's have events dir uh, QSBI select signal, which is negative. Uh, Q clock and Q data. These are the SPI signals, right? QSBI signals. So what we had before was the, the, the principle that we operated on was the STM32 does a read on here on the event pins well wait a minute sorry let me get this right uh, the first thing it did was it checks the direction pin so the QSPI the STM wants to send something this is the uh, one that we were most worried about so it checks the direction pin to make sure that the ICE 40 hasn't requested that it sends something to the STM. And if so, it does a does a read check on DIR. And if that's OK and it doesn't see that the ICE 40 has started or is asked to send something, it then does a read on the event pins to make sure that um, an event ID hasn't been placed on the bus, which is what the ICE 40 would do if it was starting an event. Um, that because that's taken up two clock cycles already, effectively. Um, so that's a kind of no. What am I talking about? Okay. Um, actually, this takes more than two clock cycles because you've got to read the direction. And if there's free um, free direction, uh, sorry, reading the direction is a one is a one one pin read. Reading the events is a free pin read if you're bit banging. If you can sort out groups where you read a bank and then master group, uh, that can be done in almost the same time as reading the direction but it, the minimum is two clock cycles it probably takes a bit longer than that you're right it's not using qk at the moment but i, I just wanted to illustrate them that, that the minimum is two clock cycles just for it to work out where it was okay um, at this point, the STM is pretty certain, right, that it doesn't, um, that there's no activity on the ICE, so it goes ahead with the transaction. So at this point, what it would do is it will take, you know, the uh, QS line down ready for a transaction. Yeah, and then it would do its right... Ooh. Okay, it's gone off at an angle. It would do its right transaction, you know, for however many bits this right was, um, however many clock cycles. Etc. And with whatever data. You know, so um, 
this period at the start where it's looking at the events would actually take quite a long time relative to the QK because these are GPIO reads even if you're reading from a group you know you're talking about you know quite a few cycles so the alternative I thought was because we're not really using these event lines other than at that point to do the read is that we forget those and we just use a QSBI with a DIR so what what happens here is we say so we get rid of this one we don't have the event lines and then what we do is uh, it checks the direction line to start with which is the same as before it then starts a single cycle read transaction and it reads whatever the data is and this is in fact um, what, what, I said, what we said was this could be a single byte okay So that will be two clock cycles effectively. If it was STR, it'd be two clock cycles. Like that. And the data we would get would be two nibbles effectively. Like that. So we'd have nibble one and nibble two. The first nibble would be the event. The second nibble would be um, the number of bytes. So this is the STM32 doing a read. So it looks at the direction line and notice that's not pulled up and then it does this read. Now what it will read back from the ice will depend on whether the ice is pending sending anything or not. Because even though it's read the DIR, in that cycle it the ice may have actually switched into I need to send something. And we've missed that on the read of the DIR. So in that case, what we will see in the first nibble is an event that is, say, non-zero. Yeah. If it's a zero event, that means it's, it's, you know, it doesn't have anything, for example. If there's a valid ID in there, 1 to 15, then that means that that peripheral associated with that event, one of 15 different peripheral events has fired um, and then the second nibble represents how many you know between naught and um, 16 bytes um, are to be read okay then the STM32 will go ahead and read those 16 bytes on the next transaction so it will initiate another transaction and read those 16 or however many bytes and it knows which peripheral it's come from because it stores the event id on the other hand if the ice 40 um, doesn't have anything that it needs to send no peripheral has initiated a send with the dispatcher running in the ice 40 what the STM will get back is a you know the special zero event ID and zero you know nibbles uh, bytes sorry uh, which it knows as a signal to uh, go ahead with its write or its send it can then send its bytes it can send 15 bytes preceded by 
the event ID in the first nibble and then the number of bytes to follow in the second part of that, you know, the second nibble. So one byte is used for the event ID, the other, the other, the other half of it is used for the number of bytes it's going to transmit. Um, so this uses a lot le less pins. It doesn't involve all the event bit banging and that, and it's probably just as fast. If you add up the cycles, it's not actually that much slower. And you don't have all the trouble you do, you know, trying to do the bit reading of the event signals. And what's more, you don't have to, you know, multiplex the SPI lines with the event lines or whatever we were going to do before. So that's the way it works. So I wanted to explain um, how that worked, really. Have you got any questions? I mean, I think Laurie understands all this because we've had these conversations. But um, I guess you don't necessarily understand or know all the details. You, you, you've probably picked up some of it from the previous streams, I guess, I post. Oh, just refreshing myself. I need some liquid. My tea's running out. Somewhat. Um, do you get what we're saying now then? So basically the packet, right, between the uh, STM32 and the ICE40 is headed by um, a kind of uh, the destination or source, which is the first nibble, and then the number of bytes that are going to follow in the transaction in the second nibble and then obviously the number of bytes involved whether that's the STM32 reading from the ice or writing to the ice yeah this this, this is the way that the STM32 and the ice 40 are dynamically communicating um, you know normally if you were using like a uh, a soft core inside the ice then that would probably have a wishbone buster peripherals etc and there'd be an addressing mechanism but in this this case what we're doing is we're using qspi as that communications medium between the stm32 and the ice 40 so that the peripherals that we've designed in the ice can be interacted with by the stm32 dynamically uh, with a relatively low latency that's what we've designed this to work you know with and actually you know the large transactions uh you know say 16 byte or 15 byte transfers are all done in dma as well so they're not actually necessarily interfering with the stm when it's doing these transactions because it's all using dma i mean um so i post says uh the stm is a proxy then well, it's kind of like that. I mean, we did st when I first looked at this and when uh, Laurie and I looked at this, we were thinking of having something like a wishbone and then the QSBI act as an interface to the Q to the wishbone. But in reality, that increased the latency dramatically because all of your QSBI reads and writes have to have, you know, complex addressing built into them, which is more bytes that have to be sent in front of every piece of data not only that but the turnaround time i.e the latency when the stm needs to respond to a peripheral inside the ice we wanted that to be as you know relatively short as possible um hence we've got you know this um q's pi as we call it um which is the protocol that we're kind of operating between the two and it's it's minimalist in terms of trying not to waste too much in terms of control bytes and nibbles that are sent. We've kind of minimized those fundamentally. But yeah, so if you're writing software on the STM32 and you're designing hardware sitting inside the ICE40, then you know you can have the ICE40 do all the hard work and you're just really dealing with the data. 
I mean, it's, you know, we, we talk about it being a bit like the PIO model that you see in the um, RP2040. That's kind of the analysis that we used here. We try and make the peripheral semi-intelligent so that really it's just exchanging data with the STM. It doesn't have to be quite as handheld as, say, a peripheral would be on a bus with, you know, uh, softcore that needs all of its, you know, status uh, register flags and all of that being handled in real time. And there's lots of register reads and writes that slow things down. We're, we're getting rid of uh, a lot of those. Um, I posted, so I guess this would be fast enough for cameras. It may be. I mean, it depends what you mean. Are you talking about taking the raw camera data or are you talking about taking, you know, a process resized data, you know? Raw data, I think you're going to flood the QSPR. And you probably wouldn't want to do that. You probably want to take process data where possible. So you design effectively a peripheral that will process your data as much as possible before sending it to the STM. When we get to the ECP, ECP, EC, the ECP5 version, there is a feature I'm looking at adding, but it requires me to write basically a streaming interface. Um, you know, basically, I can I can do the dots. Separate streaming interface. And we can do that on the ECP5 because we have the IOs to be able to do that. Also, we'll be using a slightly different microcontroller. But all that's hush hush, not there yet. Because obviously, in that sort of example, you may want to be able to stream the entire contents, you know, of video raw data but that's a different story and we're not there yet i mean you can move quite a bit of data over this the um, qsbi will run it's running str at up to i think 108 megahertz um, so that means it's delivering, you know, a byte every 54, there's 54 megabytes per second. If you're using DDR, you can actually run it up to effectively 80 megahertz, so not as high, but if you had the DDR working, and I would like to get that working later, then you'd effectively be transferring a byte with each clock, you know, on both edges. That's what the DDR mode is for. So in that case, you'd effectively be running at 160. I can't be right. Yeah, 160 megabytes per second. So that is your upper level. Um, so you could certainly do the transfers of data, but by doing so, you end up flooding the bus. So if another peripheral wants in on something, it has to interrupt that process, which you either enable or you don't. Um, hence my thoughts on maybe having a separate streaming bus later on with ECP5 that enables us to do, you know, have our cake and eat it, so to speak. But as far as uh, this goes, you know, you will probably want to make a compromise. You probably wouldn't want the video taking over the QS, you know, the, the Q's Pi bus because it's going to flood it. And with video, you might want not want the interruptions. But it is possible. But again, you might want to cut down on what data you're sending. 
do you really want to send the raw raw data to the STM32 or do you want to send something more useful you know like area of interest type information for example you know because the i40 can have calculated some of that stuff for you I don't want to get deep down the video uh, processing um, uh, conversation because that's that's something that we want to do some work on but we're probably avoiding until next year really let's get the base stuff done first on this but yeah, yeah. I am looking at the possibility of how we could add a streaming interface um, and you could do that on a tile for example if you wanted to because if you had well in fact no you can't easily do it on a tile you still got the problem to get it across to the STM so, yeah best to try and keep it in the ice where possible or as much of the processing as possible so you're sending or sharing as little quantity of data as you need to so for example if you're blob tracking rather than sending all the all the video frames what you do is you send the coordinates of the blob center and you know just the relevant pixels within that you know at a sub frame rate or whatever back to the STM you don't send the entire video signal because that would be pointless the thing that you're interested in is the thing that you're interested in not the surroundings so you'd be literally lowering the frame rate on that just taking that blob information or region of interest and moving that information over <clears throat> But anyhow, moving away from video. Um, any other questions on the um, um, the Q's pie that we need to cover? These timings, by the way, we're assuming um, uh, STR. Uh, and in fact, you know, the read check to see if peripheral sending anything is done without DMA. Because we want to do it as quickly as possible. Um, and the STM needs to know immediately what those nibbles are. We only use the DMA when we're doing a proper transfer of, you know, like 15 bytes or something. Oh, have you thought of something, um, Laurie? I hope you haven't thought of a hitch. Uh, what I explained was not quite Laurie's understanding. Okay. What did I miss? I don't mind talking about it now, Laurie. I've got nothing else on my list to cover today. It's just this stuff. Unless you want to look at the uh, board changes, but that's probably a bit boring. All 
I mean, we can do it on Discord if you prefer. It's not a problem. Uh, what default direction do you expect the ICE 40 to set? Um, I expect the default direction to be. I don't think it's the default direction. I think it. Only, I think the ICE 40 only sets the direction if it's got something to send, and it can't do so within an existing transaction. It has to do so after that transaction has um, taken place. It can't be changing the DIR in the middle of a transaction. So the direction in the idle state is ready to send. I ready for the STM to send. Sorry, I'll be more specific. Okay, so it's not consistent with my explanation. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I was showing the corner case. So let me just explain what I'm saying here. Oh, damn it. I often do this with my fingers. Come on. Hmm. Oh, stop explaining it to me. That's really annoying. Right. So, um, in the case I've shown here, when it's doing the read of the DIR line, it sees ready to send. In other words, the ICE 40 at this point isn't sending anything. However, after it started the transaction here, the ICE 40 has gone into, wants to change it, the direct, uh, the direction. So, which is why we're doing this read first. So, when, when we do this read, we find there's an event there. Maybe, or not. Because it could have changed the DIR, DIR line just after we looked, but before we pulled down QS. Remember the issue that we were dealing with before, Laurie? That kind of race condition. This gives us the extra cycle or the extra check. So, in other words, you know, the STM doesn't move directly into trying to do its right. It do always does the read first before it does a write. And that's kind of like reading the event pins were before to make sure that after. You know these transactions. There's no way that the ICE 40 can be, you know, in a state where it's um, where we haven't detected if it's trying to send something. So at this point, if we do read zero on the event um, or zero nibbles, maybe whatever combination we choose, it knows it can go straight to a right because it, within that time it hasn't. Um, hasn't responded. What will it get for the ISIS 40 still idle? That's what it will get. 
Um, so you, we could either have a zero event, you know, a special ID that means nothing pending. Or you could have zero nibbles, sorry, zero um, bytes. So you could keep 16 IDs, but have zero bytes, which is the same as there's nothing to send. In other words, the STM is then free to do a proper transaction for a write. So on the ICE 40s, it now knows that a write is coming. Okay. It was at idle, and when it does the read of the events and the number of bytes, it's at idle. But as soon as that read transaction has ended, the ICE 40 must move into a receive mode because the STM is about to send. So the end of this transaction here is the key because it now knows because the STM32 has read the events and found nothing it, it's going to go into a write next so the next transaction will be a write from the STM32 to the ICE40. It's this edge effectively that kicks off that move into receive mode. Okay, yeah, we can discuss this on Discord and go through it. This is, this is the equivalent to reading the event state that we had before, where it would read the event, um, the event pins. But instead of reading the event pins, it's read, doing a QSPI read of a single byte or two nibbles. That's all we're replacing, really. makes no sense to me okay well we can do this on discord sorry i'll be interested to know what you thought i said last time of how it was going to work maybe you've got something that's better or more optimum opt optimum what were you thinking it would happen <laughs> just out of interest Are you assuming it goes straight into the right? The STM doing the right. Uh, we can cover it down on Discord, Laurie, and go through the steps. It'll probably be tomorrow, though, not tonight. Um, any other questions? K 
case I'm considering is that the i40 is idle, waiting for data, and stays in that state. Well, it would stay in that state if the STM doesn't do anything on QSPI. You know, if the ICE 40 hasn't got anything to send and the STM doesn't have anything to send, then it will just sit there in the idle state. So Laurie said, so when the STM sets CS low, it thinks there is a right. Depends what you mean by it. By it, do you mean STM or do you mean ICE 40? From which perspective? The example I illustrated was when the STM 32 wants to write something to the ICE 40. But it can't directly go to a write. It has to do a read first to check for events. The ICE 40 thinks there is a write. <laughs> yes, but it only realizes there's a write. Well, yeah, I mean, it could realize there's a write as soon as it uh, pulls QS low. If it, you know, doesn't if it if it hasn't got anything to write to the STM, but what I'm saying here is that in this case, right, this is a prelude to a write because. Remember, we had two stages to prevent, you know, it's like a handshake to prevent the conflict of timing. Uh, when the ICE 40 suddenly decides it does have something to say after the DIR has been read. So, here, what I'm insisting on is that the STM does a single byte read over QSPI before it proceeds to do its write transaction. You know, so down here, what you don't see is at some point it does a proper write, you know, with all the data that it intended to write. And the ICE 14, and the ICE. And the I-40 knows that this is going to happen because it sees this read proceeding this right. This read here just replaces the reading of the event pins. It's something that the STM32 has to do to be sure that there isn't a race condition. It can't move directly to the right because in the time that it read the DIR signal to the time it activated the QSPI transaction, the ICE 40 could have flipped into a sending mode. It's just, yeah, if we could get rid of that initial read, that would be brilliant. But before we had this issue, of after reading the DIR, before it had chance to do the QSPI transaction, the ICE may have moved into I've got stuff for the STM mode. 
And what this does, adding that extra read before write means that the um, STM has to check that there isn't an event ID or a number of bytes pending, you know, to be sent to it. So it, read, it does a single byte read, two nibbles. It reads the event ID and the number of bytes. If both of those are zero, it goes ahead and starts its the write that it wanted to do in the first place. If we can find some way of avoiding that, it'd be brilliant, but I don't think we can. I think this is what we worked out before. But before what we did was we read the, the STM read the DIR pin, and then it read the event ID pin. By the time it had done both of those, it was sure that it could then go ahead and do a transaction. So in this case, all we're doing is we are removing the read event pins and replacing that with a single byte read on the QSPI, which is probably just as fast as reading the event pins using GPIO. So we're not actually losing anything in terms of latency. Because it's a non-DMI QSPI read as well. So the STM32 is looking directly at the nibbles coming back before it's deciding how to proceed. You know, and if there's a proper event ID there and a number of bytes waiting, that means that something happened after the STM32 read the DIR pin. You know, a peripheral on the I side set into motion, ascend, and the dispatcher has that ID that event ID and it has the number of bytes that need to be read. So in that case, the STM, rather than continuing with its write, it delays the write and then it will, you know, afterwards do a read of that number of nibbles from that device, event device. So this is a pre-write, pre-read if you like um, QSPI transaction minimum possible size one byte or two nibbles that way we shouldn't get any race conditions I hope unless you can think of something and the other advantage by using a byte rather than a nibble is we get the number of bytes as well. So we know how many bytes we're going to pick up or we're telling the ICE 40 on our next write how many bytes. We get the uh, best of both worlds, so to speak. And in fact, you know, our detection of is there an event coming from the ICE 40? doesn't necessarily mean a zero event. We could use all 16 events. It could be a zero second nibble for the number of bytes. Because if it's trying to send zero bytes, that means it hasn't got anything to send, right? So then we, we're back to having 16 rather than 15 um, event endpoints, if you like. I mean, there is another way that we could do it. You know, if you made the DIR pin bi-directional and had a pull-up, you could do the same trick that we did with events, but that makes it more complicated. And it's probably not much faster, frankly. Uh, but it should make the logic on the ice. I mean, it certainly makes the software easier, I think, on the firmware side, on the SCM32, particularly in Rust. Uh, the ice side should be simpler for the dispatcher in some ways because you don't have the events pins to manage on the IO side. 
the you know the bi-directional part of that um I mean, it should theoretically be simpler, but I mean, we'll see when you get into that. Um, one of the other points I didn't make earlier, uh, particularly for iPost, is we already have, we don't have a QSPI on the Black Eye Semex. We have a DSPI, which is QSPI in 2-bit rather than 4-bit mode. Um, Plus we have an extra CS pin between the STM32 and the UI40. So what we can do is, in the Blackwrap software, what I hope to do, hopefully next week, is take um, uh, take the HDL from Lorry, um, or a uh, future version of that that supports, you know, QSPI and DSPI, and be able to run that on Black Ice, and then you then take black crab and add that code in to be able to use that so we can actually test how this works um, on on black ice mx um, it won't be quite as fast because it's half the bandwidth because it's dspi rather than qspi but the principles are exactly the same so we can actually start testing this on black ice mx which is nice i mean we we struggled a bit uh, this week, or Laurie did in particular, because we were trying to use, we we're trying to do it with the event pins, and uh, poor old Laurie was doing most of this, and uh, he was trying to use the Arduino to do the code on the STM side, which was proving particularly difficult. Um, and in order to do it, what we what we were doing, we were falling back on using. Uh, I don't know if you're around when these were out, um, my post, but this is the previous generation of the Black Ice. This is the uh, Black Ice 2. And this ha this shared more pins between the STM32 and the Ice40. And um, that enabled us to run the extra event pins. Or it, it, it enabled... Um, Laurie to do that and to try and experiment with it. Although, um, you know, Laurie got the got the HDL working and some basic firmware. Where we hit a bit of a snag was on changing the event pins. And in Arduino, you have to change each event pin individually. Um, and if you know the STM32s, what you can do is you can change multiple pins at the same time if you want by writing directly to the registers. But of course, in Arduino, it's not quite that simple. And I think uh, Laurie did find a library that should have allowed this to happen, but um, it caused problems. So there was quite a bit of time in changing the event signal, and he had to change the HDL to cope with the fact that you know he was having to bit by bit change the event signal and stuff. Um, yeah, and we also had fun because I don't have any good Black Ice 2s. I gave my last good one away to Ken, who um, uh, gave it to one of his colleagues that needed one. However, I have a bunch of... Um, dodgy ones, let's say, that have one problem or t'other. Uh, and I managed to find one that where most of this stuff was working um, and the bits that weren't working weren't really affecting us. But getting that working on Arduino proved Laurie and I had to jump through some um, fairly complicated hoops on Windows, getting the drivers to behave themselves um, with Arduino, among other things. Uh, it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, so I never got it working on my side. I mean, I got Arduino working, but I didn't get the uh, get the code running with the HDL. Um, I always have nightmares with Arduino stuff. I don't know why. It's probably why I never use it. And of course, now that I always think it's a nightmare, I tend to avoid trying to use it. But um, yeah. But Laurie got quite a long way with that. But with this this new version, 
uh, I'm going to use the Black Crab software. It's going to be written in Rust, and it will also run on the Black Ice MX, which is cool. Right, my learning resource for Rust or resources. I mean, I've had a little bit. I mean, Rust is a bit difficult. Um, I mean, it's a nice language, but from an embedded point of view, it can be a bit tricky because it's rather different. Um, it's like having, um, you know, um, your compiler becomes your uh, code reviewer. <laughs> it's one way of putting it. And it has things like borrow checkers and stuff. And getting that stuff to behave on the embedded side is... Um, tricky to say the least and it is it you know it does the right thing but you you know we're all so used to being lazy and doing what the damn hell we like in C you know badly um that when we come to something that actually knows what it's doing and is checking what we're doing with memory locations and that kind of stuff um you know, it becomes a bit of a quagmire as you're trying to move through it because you're still in the C mindset. Um, and in order to get things to work with the borrow checker and stuff, they've come up with a zero overhead scheme for GPIOs. Um, it's very smart, but it's, you know, it's not an easy learning curve, to be quite honest. Um, I have recently found some stuff that covers it better um, and I'm still kind of reading that and uh, even that is not comprehensive but um, when I've gotten through some of those other bits I, I want to make a, um, a list of things uh, resources that are worth looking at to try and make it easier to learn in the first place because I've kind of learned the hard way I've realized that uh, well, why did I choose Rust <laughs> I've liked Rust for a lot for a long time I originally looked at it I wrote a bunch of tests in Rust you know years and years ago um, for some Ethernet stuff that I was working on on Xmos but um, I like the language from a high level point of view as well. I love the communication aspects and the way it can be bent into a kind of CSP like um, approach. And it is very good if you're doing concurrency, for example. It's got very good models and it's got great things and it's got pattern matching as well of sorts using the match statements. And I love pattern matching. Um, so I've always wanted to do that on embedded um, and Rust enables me to get there. Um, but of course you're dealing with uh, hardware that hasn't been necessarily designed with that in mind and that's half the issues that you stumble across when you start trying to understand the GPO operations and the borrow checking and the safety and all the other bits and pieces um, because they've all been designed with C in mind and not with safety in mind quite frankly well the fallback plan is I can always return to using um, the STM32 HAL which we all know and love I'm sure he didn't detect any sarcasm. Um, but of course, I have no intention of using the fallback plan. So, um, that is the plan to use Rust. And I think, I think we will get there. I mean, I'm probably... What I probably want to do, um, you probably won't be on vac vacation next week, will you, um, iPost? But anyhow, I was thinking of maybe 
doing some of the rust next week on Black Ice 2 for the event stuff and also trying out the um, Misu Muzzy Swap. Um, so that could have been a bit more rust interactive but um, yeah what, what, what time would a stream be good I post it, it needs to be later for you doesn't it that's the problem for you because you're working when I normally stream right so um, that's why you have to see the recordings although they've messed up our moving event at work so I can watch for up to you can watch for up to a month what well, you can watch this stream for up to a month at my normal times You can work from home for a month. Yahoo! So anyhow, yeah, I may cover some of the rust stuff next week. Or at least from the Black Crab point of view, i.e. the new firmware side. The other thing we'll be able to do potentially is um, backport Black Crab to Black Ice. Black Ice MX, that is. I'll go through twinkles. Which will be nice. Um, and that will eventually include something that's better for writing um, to the flash. Something better than we had before with the STM32 house stuff. We were thinking about maybe adding a DFU mode, possibly. Or a mass storage type mode. But um, that's a bit further down the road. Anyhow, any more questions? Because if not, I'm going to um, uh, end the stream now. So I've got to get something to eat. I'm starving. And I've got a whole bunch of other stuff I've got to do this evening. Um, if not, well, the stream next week, my intention is to do... What is the date next week? Wednesday. Hold on, let me just double check. yeah that should be fine so I'll probably stream again similar sort of time next week and yes maybe we could aim at doing some of the rust stuff some of the black crab black crab stuff using you know the Q's pie and also our swapping of miso and miso that would be nice rather than having the bit bangy probably faster than you like okay yeah. right guys um i will see you all next week i will obviously be down on discord probably not today but um Um, tomorrow I will be on a um, Discord. I've got a problem with the forum I post. There's not much I can do about it at the moment. I can't get into the server. The person that's got the SSH keys has disappeared off the earth, I'm afraid. Um, so I have to literally replace it, which means reinstalling everything. Um, which is a bit of a nightmare. Um, there's very little I can do at this point. 
Um, my, I, I was intending re, uh, rewriting the server parts in the new year anyhow, bringing up a new version of Discord. But I've still got to migrate the stuff, whatever happens. So that's going to be fun. But my problem at the moment is I can't get in the existing um, server. I do have some Discord backups, which I hope to be able to import into a new version. But what I really need is somebody that knows what they're doing <clears throat> that can help me with that because I'm crap at all that stuff. If you know anyone, let me know. Right, guys, folks, I will see you all next week, or if not, down on the forum. Um, have a good rest of the week. Ciao.